If you'll open your Bibles, we start a new series of studies here today. Called Truly, Truly, I Say to You. I couldn't think of a better line that Jesus gave me, so I used it. What you probably, you've heard that, I know, truly, truly, I say unto you, especially if you read the book of John. 23 times in 10 chapters of 20, there are 21 chapters in the book of John. 10 of those, Jesus preaches, truly, truly, I say unto you. 23 times in 10 chapters, he preaches, truly, truly, I say unto you. I think might, we sometimes might jump over sayings like that. Maybe we jump over because we don't understand them. I hope that's the cause because I'm certainly going to explain it. But these are, when you read in the Gospel of John, truly, truly, I say to you, and John's the guy who does, does this. Now, they're, they're mentioned in other places of the Gospels, but nowhere near like John. John picked up on this this teaching of Jesus when he would say, verily, verily, I say unto you, Christ would give great doctrinal statements from them. And John apparently kept them. He took his notes home with him and studied them. The thing I recommend for you to do. And later he comes back and God puts on his heart to write a book. And, and half of his book is on the teachings, verily, verily, I say unto you. And they're great teachings. Often we quote verses from these without verily, verily, I say unto you. I'll give you an example. In my lesson passage today, this verily, verily, I say unto you, <clears throat> in the third chapter of John, that's where we are, in the third chapter of John, verses 1 through 21, which is where Jesus is, teaches this first series of truly, true, I say unto you, He's with a guy called Nicodemus. You're familiar with that. And probably the most famous verse quoted out of the Bible, at least the New Testament, is John 3.16, which is in the middle of this. And everybody quotes that and misses, truly, truly, I say unto you. John 3.16 came in part of a passage dealing with verily, verily, I say unto you. He says it three times. So we're going to take a look at this. I'm, in the, this hour, I'm, I'm going to look at the first eight verses. And in the first eight verses, he uses this word, truly, truly, I say unto you, twice. So let's take a look. Now, therefore, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. <clears throat> now, there's something interesting about it. He's a Pharisee. Listen, and he is uh, later, Jesus is going to say, how, how is it that you don't know this, being a teacher? This guy was a theologian, a teacher. I mean, he, was, he, he either went to the, the seminary school of Shemal or Hillel. He's one of those two schools. And, and, you know, it doesn't tell us, so there's a lot of guess around it. But uh, he might have went to school with Paul <laughs> out of that school of Pharisee. Um, might have been a little older than Paul, but, but anyhow, he, he, he is a, a theologian, a, we would say a doctor of theology today. <clears throat> and uh, Jesus is going to talk to him about spiritual birth, and he don't have a clue, and he says, how is it? He's going to lay two verily verilies on him, and then Jesus is going to say, how is it that you don't understand spiritual birth? How is it that you're a great teacher, a, a renowned teacher, of the Bible and don't understand what you must do to be saved. Hmm. So this is Nicodemus. This man came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, which was a, a greeting of, from one teacher to another, one rabbi to another rabbi, one rabbi to another rabbi. That's an honorable salute between men of the word. He's, he's, he, he is a rabbi, and he's speaking to a rabbi, both teachers of the word. Remember that. Rabbi, we know. Who is the we? He's talking about those who are the same way of thinking that he is 
in regard to who Jesus is. We Pharisees, or at least a group of Pharisees, who are trying to figure out theologically who Jesus is. That's important because later Jesus is going to come back and talk to them about them versus Jesus. So this is important. <laughs> he says, Rabbi, we know, watch, watch two things he knows. As a group now, the we is a group. We know, this is what they've concluded, the Pharisees, at least a group with them, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. A hodadaskalas, there's a definite article with it. And this is why, for no one can do these signs. I want you to pay attention to that because in, in our first, truly, truly, I say to you, he's going to come back in reference to that word sign that he said. Now remember, Nicodemus said, we have seen signs of evidence, right? That's important. For no one can do these signs. You know, the Jews, you know, First, uh, first Corinthians 1, uh, 22, Jews seek signs, Gentiles seek wisdom. Remember that? For no one can do these signs. Now, you got your Bible open, haven't you? Okay, there's a Bible in front of you. Get that out and look at John. For no one can do these signs that you do unless, unless God is with him. Now, watch this. Jesus turns around and gives him the first truly, truly I say to you. Unless, now look. I just, we just had, look, the word signs and unless are keys. Jesus comes back, and truly, truly, I say to you means he's going to drop a bombshell of theology on him. A truly, truly, I say to you is a big bombshell of theology. It is a big doctrinal point. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, now remember he said, he's, Nicodemus said signs and unless. We, we've seen signs that, that uh, no one could do unless no one could do unless God is with you, right? We've seen signs, right, that God is with you. Now watch. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one, unless a person, unless anyone, it's the word tish, is born again, actually, if your Bible says, let's see how sharp your Bible is, either in the footnotes or in reference, this does not say born again. This says born from above. Born from above. It's not the word again. It's the word above. Unless, because it's, a, it's about God. See, he, he has identified the fact Nicodemus has identified that he is positive towards God, that he is God, what we call God conscious. But he thinks he's saved because he does religious stuff, because he goes to church, because he does religious stuff. Nicodemus thinks he's saved when really what he has is God consciousness. And it is God consciousness that's brought him to Christ in order to present the gospel to him so they can really be saved and not just be religious. Okay. Truly, 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 I say to you, unless, he used that word on him, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, Nicodemus says, we know that you have come from God because of the signs of evidence, which were miracles. He's been raising the dead. He's been healing the blind. Nicodemus responds to him, how can a man, he asks a question, in fact, he's going to ask two, watch the two questions. How can a man be born when he is old? 
He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus, now watch. This is important now. He's going to, he's, because he's open. Nicodemus is open. He's open to have the gospel presented. He's bringing them into that. He says to him, truly, truly, I say to you. See, he dropped the first bombshell on him, and, 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 and he's with him. His questions show he's, he's following along and struggling with the answer, right? He, but he's with him. He's, he hasn't pushed back and going, nah, I don't want to hear anything about God. Nah. See, he's not doing that. See, he's engaged. He's listening, like many of you. He's listening. And so Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, and he comes back to the word unless, unless one is born of water and spirit, and he's going to explain that in a minute, unless he's born of water and spirit, uh, he cannot enter. Now watch. You missed it, so let's go back to the two questions he asked him, because you missed it. How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time, can he? You with me? See, Jesus is answering his questions, theologically bringing him to a place of, be of salvation. You do see how he's working this. He's engaged. Jesus is engaged with what he's saying to him, and he's using terms that, that are common terms with him that he's asked. Do you understand? See, the key word is he can't enter into his mother's womb a second time. So what are we talking about? Jesus says, verily, verily, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter. See, that's a key word. The other one was see. Now it's the word enter. Why? Because Nicodemus is paying attention. He's with him. He's working him. You understand? Mm-hmm. Okay. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then he explains water and spirit. He says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Then he says, do not be shocked. The word marvel means don't be shocked because Nicodemus is back on his heels. What is this born again stuff? What is this spiritual birth you're talking about? So there comes my title, dialogue, right? What's my title? Dialogue of spiritual birth. There is a dialogue going on, a dialogue going on. There is an interest. Jesus is trying to bring him out of religion and into relationship with God through Christ. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born, I'm talking about a second birth. I'm not talking about a flesh birth. I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. I'm talking about a birth that takes place by the Holy Spirit. Do, do not marvel or don't be shocked that I say to you, you, Nicodemus, must be born again. Because no one can see the kingdom of God and no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Now, I've set you back on your heels a moment because you think that if you're religious, that you'll be saved. That's not true. There may be you here today that think that if, you were, if you're religious, if you go to church, if, if you stop doing bad things and start doing good things, that God will recognize that and you'll be able to go to heaven because of that. That's not true. That's not true. Listen, you, go to have, you don't go to heaven until you good, do good things, and you don't go to hell because you do bad things. You go to heaven because you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you go to hell because you reject it. It's that simple. This is not complicated. You must be born again. You must be born again. You will never see to understand the kingdom of God. You will never enter into the kingdom of God unless you are spiritually born. Your first birth, no matter where you take it, won't take you to God. It'll take you to God consciousness, 
and religion has helped Nicodemus. A monotheistic religion called Judaism has helped Nicodemus to come to a place in his life where he needs more than God. He needs a relationship with God. He's in a relationship with works. And he's the top of this class of works. He's sitting on a mountain of works, of religious works. And he's the, he's, the, he's the king of the mountain. And Jesus says, it won't get you there. I mean, you can, borrow, you can build that tower of Babel of works, and it'll never get there. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's a mystery. It's not a mystery to God. It's not a mystery of new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It's not a mystery to God, and it's not a mystery to those who have entered the kingdom. It's a fact. But for me to be able to explain to you the spiritual birth, I just did it. Now it's a matter of you believing it. And it'll be a mystery until you believe it. And once you believe it, it'll no longer be a mystery. It'll be a truth. It'll be a truth. Well, I want to stop there because I want to do my study in my first hour on this very idea at the top of your paper. Have I had a prayer? Have I had a prayer? Okay. All right. Well, wow. About the time to go get a cup of coffee, and I haven't had prayer with you. Let me, let me have prayer. Be sure that you are a spiritual person. If you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, if you believe that for your salvation, then you're saved. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, whoever, everyone who believes it in Romans 1.16. If that's true, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He's the great teacher of the, whole, of the human spirit. Truth. And I don't mean any kind of truth. I mean absolute truth. Not just any truth, absolute truth. In order for the Holy Spirit to teach you truth today, you've got to be sure that you're not carnal. Identity of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins, the tongue of vert sins. They should be confessed in silence through your priesthood. According to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, how thankful we are for that privilege. Through the propitious work of Christ, we confess our sins. We're back into fellowship with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, with the Father, who is our Heavenly Father, always will be our Heavenly Father. Even when we are disciplined by Him, we are still loved by Him. I pray today, Father, that we would get this message of spiritual birth within our souls. It is the key. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or not religious. It matters whether or not you have been born again. So we look at today, Father, and see it in Jesus' name. Amen. I put all the different 23 times this word truly, truly is used, and I put it in the chapters, the 10 chapters. I've listed them on the top of your paper so that you will have some place to go look and read on them. <clears throat> uh, Vines, in his l little book, Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words, on page 25, he talks about this word, Amen. He talks in very generic terms, but it's a, it's a good definition. He says that amen is a transliteration from Hebrew. Many churches today, you hear the word amen a great deal. They may know what it means and they may not. It may be cultural, it may not be biblical, but amen is a biblical, biblical term with a biblical understanding. Amen is transliterated from the Hebrew into both Greek and English. Amen. I wrote the Hebrew word. Remember, in Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. And so you have Aleph that looks like an X on your paper. It's a silent letter. And then you have an A and an M and an E and an N. And so that's the word amen. It's a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word that's brought, brought into prominence 
through the teaching of Jesus Christ. That was a very prominent word in the Old Testament. But not, but not a prominent word in the day of Jesus Christ. It wasn't being used a lot, but it was a word that would be used on Jewish holiday festivals like Passover or uh, some of the others. It would have been a word that would have been ceremonial because it was used doxo in doxologies, which we'll talk about. <clears throat> okay? Today, we looked at this famous story as we, we're in a series on Truly, Truly, I Say to You. One of the most famous ones, of course, is the John 3, where there's this dialogue and then a discourse, a dialogue and a discourse on the danger if you don't believe. He, Jesus is going to talk to him about how important it is for you to enter the kingdom of God through new birth and how dangerous it will be for you if you reject it. <clears throat> that will deal with the third. But truly, truly, I say to you. As a theological term, a man is based on the essence of the Godhead. <laughs> Believe it or not. <clears throat> this word amen in the Hebrew as a biblical term is used to declare at one of the essence of the Godhead called veracity or the truthfulness of God. That's why this word in the English here in this passage, if you have a King James Bible, it's going to say verily, verily. If you have an a English translation of that word like NAS or NIV, it's going to say truly, truly, because this word emphasizes the veracity of God. It emphasizes the veracity of God. <laughs> and I can't tell you how important that is to this word, and this word is used a lot. As I said, Jesus, John recorded how much he used that word in his book. In Hebrews 6.18, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. That's veracity. It's impossible for God to lie. Then what is it? God, God is forced within his own nature and character to tell the truth, always truth. Now, let me, let me tell you something that's been lost in our culture today. What is being lost in American culture today since the, two th since the 21st century, we have dropped out of absolute truth into relativism. <clears throat> and the church, the church has not fought it well enough. The essence of God is absolute truth. When you throw absolute truth out of a culture and out of a church, you are now attacking the very essence and character of God from which the Bible, the church, and everything else is founded on. We're not the first culture, by the way, to do this. And we should look at the cultures have done that, where Christians, where Christianity has had an influence about that nation, and see what happens to those nations when they do give this up. The thing, that the, the, the thing that the Bible brings is absolute truth to a culture. Absolute truth is the word of God. Absolute truth. It's based on the, on the character of God. God cannot lie. God does not lie. He cannot lie. The devil, on the other hand, who runs the world system of 1 John 5, 19, is a liar. He's the father of lies, and he can't do anything but lie. And there's your war. He represents relative truth, and God represents absolute truth. And there's our war today. And the church has got to be able to, be able to stand in that gap One of the great, and this word, truly, truly, I say unto you, means this comes from the heart of God to you. This is based on the divine essence. This is a very powerful idea. In, in Jesus' great prayer, before he goes to the cross with the Father, he says, in that prayer, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you 
I mean, do you really know him? Do you, honestly, now I know you go like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you really know him? I mean, do you really know God? Or do you know about him? See, there's a difference. I mean, do you know about somebody or do you live with them? See, you know about me. Jane knows me. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about, do you know me? See, this whole new birth is about a relationship where you get to know God and are comfortable with what you know. Where Christ is at home in your life. He's not a guest who shows up once a week when you come to church or once in a while when you get in a tank or something and begin to plead for God. No. This is eternal life. That you may that they may know you, the only true God. See the word true, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You know who, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the only true God. See the, the only true God. The only true God. In Revelation, the third chapter, verse 14, John, the writer of our gospel, John, the writer of our gospel, refers to Jesus Christ as the Amen. As the Amen. John, the writer of our book, the Amen. He writes to the church of Laodicea. The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the the beginning of the creation of God says this. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He calls him the great AM. Amen. The great Amen. Jesus refers this way in John 1 14 through 17. John picked this up. When, he, when John says, we have seen the one and only come from the Father who is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Talking about Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, for as many are the promises of God, in him they are yes, therefore also through him is our Amen which means so on the human side, it means so let it be. See, what, what the word amen has a God side and a man side. Every amen has a God side and a man side. On the God side, it's a doctrinal principle he wants you to learn. And it shall be, so let it be. Something of that nature on the God side. It is and shall be so. Look, look under there, uh, under point one. He, here's the God side of the amen. There's always a God side and a man side. The God side is going to state the doctrinal, his doctrinal position, a commandment of some sort. And it means it is and shall be so. And on man's side, when he under hears it, understands it and believes it, he says to God, so let it be. That's the word amen. So let it be. I accept it with full responsibility. Hey, listen. Hey, listen. For as many are the promises of God, see, promises of God, in him they are yes, therefore also through him, in him they are yes, so through him is our amen, so let it be, to the glory of God through us. Whatever God wants from me, 
I'm going to get a handle on it. I'm going to come to hear it. I'm going to understand it. I'm going to believe it. And then I'm going to apply it. So let it be. I'm going to embrace it to the end. Because Romans 4.21 says, whatever God has promised, he is able to bring it to the conclusion. He is able to bring the promise to performance. A man, now here's what's unique. A man is always used at the end, not at the beginning. It's used in the a biblical principle as a, uh, a doxology conclusion, a conclusion to a doxology. The amen usually is placed at the end of a very important principle in the singular. Remember, an amen always has God's side and it has a man's side. The God side is going to present a, a great doctrinal principle that's important for your life with an idea, it is and so shall it be. In other words, I want to run this out in your life, right? What I promised, I'm going to perform. And you, once you understand it, you're going to say, so let it be. I accept it. So let it be. Now let me show you something. Let me show you something. Once you go to Deuteronomy, once you go to Deuteronomy with me, the 27th chapter, I want you to go down with me to, well, verse 12. We can go to verse 11. Moses charging the people. He divides the 12 tribes of Israel into two groups. He puts one group on a mountain over here who's going to pronounce blessings, and he puts another six tribes over on another mountain with a valley in between them. And he's going to put them over there, six tribes. We're talking about 300,000 300, people on this side. That's a pretty good ball game. 300,000 people over here, and another 300,000 people over here, they're about there that. See, sometimes we, we say six tribes over here and we think six people or something. I don't know what we think. They're going to pronounce the blessings and it's going to echo through this valley like you can't believe, the acoustics. And then the others over here are going to pronounce the cursings. All right. You with me? This is what's happened as we come into this. On one, one, one side and on the other side. All right? Now, on this, on the one we're looking at, we're on, the, we're on the mountain side of cursing. On the mountain side of cursing. And the Levites shall then answer and say to all the men of Israel, loud voice. The Levites are going to give a statement as from God himself. And it means it is and shall be. And the Levite, which is a large tribe, we're talking about a lot of people, 100,000 guys are going to say in unison, and there are 12 of the, their curses, and there are 12. If you read, if you, if you looked, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you'd find 12. Right? Six tribes. Levites going to say it. The Levites are going to say it, and uh, and so let's just take verse fifteen. Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molden image, an abomination to the Lord, the works of the hand of the crafty man, and sets it up in secret, and then all the people shall answer and say, "What." Which actually, which actually means what? So, huh? So let it be, right? A man means in your heart. You see, it means so let it be. So the Levites and listen, watch now. Look, that's the first one. Agreed. 
Every one of them. Look at them. Every one of them. Look at the go. Look at every one of them. Then you drop down to verse 26. That's the 12th. Cursed is he who does not con confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people said, Amen. You see that? See, this is a typical way an amen is used in a doxology. And, and, um, and, and uh, y y working with the congregation. The Levites would come. But we've seen these in churches where the pastor recites a certain passage and the people respond to it. You see it a lot in Catholic churches, Episcopals, and that type of thing. They do this. When I first went into Baptist, we used to do it. In the back of the hymn, they had it. In the, in the back of the Baptist hymns, they had these. And you could do these. You could do it on special occasions, Mother Days and all these kind of days. Where was the amen on 12 of these? Where was the amen located? At the front or the back? That's not what Jesus did. That was the typical way it was used. Statement from God. Do you hear it? Do you understand it? And here's what the Hebrew people, Shema, Shema. You know, the priest would come out and say, Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Shema. Then he would say, whatever. And the people would go, Amen. Listen, they man is not the cheering section. That's the ball players. That's the people got to go to the fourth quarter with it. Not, it's not a cheer group. This is a group that said, look it, you better get this because you got to the fourth, you got to, listen, you better get this in, inside because this is a fourth quarter idea in your life when you got to reach really deep down in you and still believe. Jesus didn't put this at the end. But Nicodemus knew where it went, and he knew that Jesus put it at the beginning. Listen, Nicodemus would have been a guy who did this all the time in the church. And the people would say, hey, man, so let it be. You understand that? Nicodemus would have been familiar with all of these amen sections of the Old Testament. Jesus didn't put it at the end. He put it at the beginning. And he didn't do it singular. He doubled it up. He put the hero Israel at the beginning of this thing. Are you listening to me? Listen, open up your ears and listen to me. I'm about to lay a great doctrinal idea on you, and you've got to have the ears to hear and a heart to believe because this is a fourth quarter deal. <laughs> I mean, he threw a monkey wrench, as they say, into it. He put the amens on the front. Truly, truly, I say unto you. He put it on the front. Then gives the doctrinal statement. And listen, they all in this case are all dealing with spiritual birth. What you get, and listen, there is the two hills. On the one side is the blessing. On the back side is the cursing. And you're going to see in the first two, he offers them the blessing side of it. And when he gets to the third, truly, truly, I say to you, he's going to deal with the cursing side, that there is a danger in rejecting the spiritual birth, Nicodemus. There is a great danger in your life. In Deuteronomy 27, now listen to me, in Deuteronomy 27, you know what the next chapter teaches? Huh? You know what chapter 28 is about? Well, it does. It opens with blessings. You know what it ends with? Cursings. And you know what the cursings are called? Five cycles of divine discipline. That's chapter 28. Hello, church. How about that? How about that? 
He brings the blessings and the cursings into the reality of life within the nation of Israel. In chapter 28, first half is the blessings. The second half of it is the cursings, and we call it the five, the five disciplines, the five cycles of divine discipline and the priest nation of Israel. All set up in chapter 27. Now it's, it's played out in chapter 28, and it's played out in history, isn't it? North Kingdom in 722, the South Kingdom in 586, and then 70 A.D. <laughs> Do you know how powerful, important the amens were in chapter 27 on the mountain of the cursing? Do you understand how important the amen at the end of that is? That's fourth quarter stuff you got to have. You got to have that in your gut when the fourth quarter comes to your life and you're down, you're, you're running on, on, on faith and faith alone, none of this other stuff. I mean, you're pulling from the, your guts of faith. You better have that amen in you, not some old verbal gobbledygook. Hey, man, brother. Better be, be better be, uh, and whatever you told me, God, I'm okay with. Have you got that? <laughs> yeah, that old amen, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Placed at the end, it is, on the front of it, it is and so shall it be. On the back side, so let it be. So let it be. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. The doubling of the amen by Jesus is teaching what I am speaking comes from first hand authority. Put it on the front. Listen, when you get a doubling of an amen anywhere, it's a big deal. In Psalms 89 52, he gives it as a double amen. The, David writes, Bless be the Lord forever. A man and a man. This is rare in the Old Testament. And when it's given at the end, when you give a double A man at the end, it really pounds the emphasis of what's just been said. And that is blessings. Blessings. Do you know what's interesting in that Deuteronomy deal? The blessing sides, there was no amens. Didn't need them. They're all on the cursing side. You're going to need them. You're going to have to really believe. When everything around your life falls inward, inward, And just you, you and God, you really need to have that relationship. Get it now. Have it now. Have it now. What Jesus is saying by putting the amen on the front is absolute truth. Therefore, what I am speaking is absolute truth. It is and it, sh and it shall be so. This is absolute. And he doubles it up. When he, he doubles it up, it goes like, this is absolutely true. And Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus from the God side. It's whether or not Nicodemus will speak from the man side. Because Jesus is speaking from the divine side when he says, Nicodemus, you will not see the kingdom of God. You will not see the kingdom of God unless you are spiritually born. Nicodemus, you talk the talk, but you ain't got the walk, son, because you haven't believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your father Abraham did. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 8, Abraham believed the gospel and was saved. Nicodemus, not only will you not see the kingdom of God, see, Nicodemus, when he walked into the presence of Christ that day, he thought he 
He had seen the kingdom of God. He was a speaker of the kingdom of God. He, he spoke about it. But he couldn't see it because he hadn't been born again. Can't get it from seminary. You got to get it from Jesus Christ. Can't get it from theological teachings. You've got to get it from Jesus Christ. Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You walked in here thinking that you were in the midst of the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you haven't even entered into it because the only way into it is you've got to be born again. How was a person born again? Don't leave this first service until you understand. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, Old Testament. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures, Old Testament. He's quoting the Old Testament. You've got to be born again. How are you born again? By being, all of a sudden, become, become religious? Change your ways? I don't care if you want to change your ways. That's not how you get saved. Listen, that's just human willpower. You know it don't work all the time. That's why you keep sliding back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth, 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 back and forth. You've never been born again. You don't have the spiritual power in you. Listen, the flesh can't beat the flesh. All that is is reform. The Bible is not trying to get you to reform. The Bible is trying to get you to transform. Get into transformation. Not conformity to the world, but transformity by the renewing of your mind. That's the name of the game. come to church with just once in a while, come to church with an understanding of what it's there about. This church is about teaching you how to live the Christian life, how to live it. You haven't figured out it yet. You haven't figured it out. You haven't figured it out. How long is it going to take you to figure it out? Listen, pick a night. We meet Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Sunday. I don't care what night you pick out, but pick that night out and come for a year. Don't miss that night for a year. Pick one of them and come for a year. And I will show you in a year, by your own volition, I will show you how you can win over your flesh, how you can win over bad decisions, how you can win over your addiction, how you can win over your bad decisions. I'll show you how to do it. This is, it's, it's, it's not complicated. You've made your life very complicated. It all begins with, are you born again? Do you believe for your personal salvation that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day? If you believe it, you're saved. It's a matter of you not being saved. It's a matter of you not relying upon all the things, all the divine assets, that's all the grace assets that God's given you to live the victorious Christian life. You're not living victorious. You're up one day, down two, up three, one, down four. You're all over the place. There's no, there's no steadiness in you because you don't know how to walk in the Spirit. You don't know how to walk by faith. You don't know how. You go to churches, they tell you why. They don't tell you how. They tell you you ought to be saved, and they don't tell you how. They tell you you should walk in the Spirit, but they don't tell you how. They tell you why you should walk by faith, but they don't tell you how. We tell you how. You pick out a night, 6.30 Wednesday night, 6.30 uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night at 6.30, and then, of course, here, two services on Sunday in the morning. Pick a day and stay with a day. We have just started a new series on Sunday. If Sunday's the best day for you, I don't want to see you once a month. I want to see you every Sunday. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Ah. Some of you didn't say it, and I thank you. None of that gobbledygook stuff. Because what does it mean if you say, if you on the human side say amen, it means? So let it be. You can count on me, Pastor. Save my place. I'll be there every Sunday. All right. Let's pray. We're going to close this service with a prayer, and then we're, men will take the offering. Then we got coffee and donuts downstairs. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we'd like to spend some, meet you and 
Then we'll be back after 15 minutes for our second half. Al, if you'll do this offertory prayer. Oh, what a great privilege to be part of your family through faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you've made this simple for those who need to be saved. If anybody here that is not saved, the decision could be made very clear. I pray that you will motivate through the Spirit uh, anyone to make that decision. I also pray, Father, for what is given today for our, our monetary giving, that you will take it and multiply it many times. We know, Father, that you're always going to be enough. And we praise you in Christ's name. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he did something really unique that probably has a, a more importance to the Jewish age people than one might imagine, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the things that amen, amen, or truly, truly, the, the fact that must not be ignored about it is this carries the weight of absolute truth. It, it, there's a divine side to an amen, and there's a human side. Uh, <clears throat> and from the divine side, whatever's being stated as a doctrinal truth, a spiritual truth, stands, the essence of God stands behind it. God has put his full essence behind the truthfulness of that statement. And when the believer responds so let it be, he's responding that what, he's doing the, he's doing the Romans 4.21. He's saying that, I believe that what God has promised, he is able, he has the essence, the power, the structure of his being to bring it to, to pass or to be fulfilled, to be performed. Romans 4.21 is a powerful little piece of scripture that would be well worth your time to get in your notebook of your brain. Uh, so what Jesus is doing with Nicodemus is really important. I want you to see this because this dialogue needs to take place in our lives with Amer in America today. We Christians need to have this dialogue with America, with the people of America. And what he is saying, what he's speaking about the absolute truthfulness, he's saying, he's saying that what, by putting it on the front of his saying, so, so, see, he says, amen, I say to you. He doesn't say, I say to you, amen. He says, amen, amen, what I'm saying to you. And therefore, he's speaking, he's speaking from a position. Oh, wow. He's speaking from a position of absolute authority. You and I can speak that way to other people based on the word of God. The word of God is the absolute authority of his word, of him. When we can speak to people that way, um, in love, we can speak with absolute authority. I can't tell you how many people I meet. They're just all over the place. They're all over the place. <clears throat> and you say to them, well, I like what John, you know how John closes out his teaching on his book? It's in a, I think he goes 21 chapters. So it's in the 20th chapter before he signs off. He says, these things I have written unto you that you might believe. I mean, that's the bottom line. These things I have written to you. These things I have written to you so that you might believe. You know, what are you believing? You're believing that this, these are absolutes for your life. They're absolutes. I, I was looking at a stat the other day. Uh, Evangelical Christianity, you know, we're, we have a category of our own now. Evangelical Christianity, which separates us from Christianity in that we believe the, the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God. Uh, we believe that these aren't myths. We don't believe the Garden of Eden is a myth. Uh, we don't think heaven is a myth. And so they've they've lumped us into a group. It was interesting to me that 70% 70, 70 of us evangelicals who believe the inspired word of God, yeah, 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 
Only 70% of them believe in the absolute. I was shocked at that. That means there's 30% of us that, that aren't visitors. There are 30% of us that are consistent in our, our beliefs and stuff who don't believe that they're, that they're absolutes. I mean, how can you carry the Bible and not believe there's absolutes? I mean, the very essence of God demands it. <clears throat> I saw another stat that said uh, that 40%, 42% of the of uh, non-evangelical Christians, 42 percent, only 42 percent of the rest of the church uh, of Christianity believes in absolute truths. And by the way, they're in the majority of Christianity by numbers, by sheer numbers. I mean, that's frightening to me. So listen, that gives you a lot of dialogue. Now we've all had dialogues with those people. Uh, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, you people. Uh, Nicodemus was one of those guys uh, in Israel. But listen, here's what I'm really saying to you. Listen, we have a large opportunity for dialogue today, even within evangelicals. There's a great, a great besides, besides the greater Christian church out there, uh, a great chance to, to talk to people doctrinally. That's pretty amazing to me. A and um, so he, he's talking, to, now, now here, here's the relevancy of this. He's talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is, a, is a, a professor, a doctor of theology. I mean, he's, you know, he's one of the guys. And Jesus is talking to him in a declining nation. Israel is on their way out. In 40 years, Israel will be under the fifth cycle of discipline to the second coming of Christ. Think about that. You talk about a little discipline? <laughs> if anybody should say, come, Lord Jesus, it would be them, wouldn't it? Listen, a declining nation... A declining nation in Israel are the people who have paid any attention to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, right? How could you be in decline if you understood 27 and 28 of Deuteronomy? If, if, if this thing is being taught and you're saying amen at the end of each one of the curses and now you're living them out in reality because you're negative to the word of God, that's Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And we'll see, we'll see whether he comes in or goes out. We'll see at the, at the end of this whole thing, we'll find out whether Nicodemus sees the kingdom of God by new birth, whether he enters the kingdom by new birth. We'll see. Well, you've, you've read ahead, haven't you? And you know he came, don't you? Came in. And listen, we know he came in because he put it all at risk when he went and took the body of Christ and buried it. He put it all at risk. Uh, and, of course, there's a movie out if you want to see it. There's always a movie about something, Andrew. Listen, absolute truth. We live in a day just like Nicodemus where absolute truth is named taught in the church. And it gives us a great opportunity for great ministry out there. You think your Christian friends are in absolute truth? The odds are they're not. <clears throat> the odds are they're not. They're into relative, they're into human viewpoint relative truth that says the only truth is what one knows as truth is whatever is right in his own eyes. How do you know that you're right and I'm wrong? It's what's right in my eyes that's important. Do you see how it's crept in? The church is full of this idea. Now, it's, I'll tell you what truth is. It's what God says. And the rest of it is gobbledygook. Listen, in the period, the, the book of Judges, the book of Judges closes with this warning. That's 2125. It closes with this warning. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and here's relative, here's relative truth. Everyone 
did what was right in his own eyes. That's relative truth. That's the way we live today. It don't matter what the Bible says. These Christian people, they'll throw their marriage under the bus. They'll throw their children under the bus. They don't give a rip about absolute truth. They live, they live only what is good for me. If it's good for me, then that's good. If, if it's... If, if, and boy, are we going to pay a penalty for this. Are we ever going to pay a penalty for this? Relative truth is cosmos diabolicus of Satan. It's worldly thinking. The God of this world is pushing an agenda, and he always tries to counterfeit. Here's absolute truth, the word of God. What do they go for? They go for relative truth. In Romans 12, 2, the Bible calls, or Paul calls it, conformity to the world's thinking. We have conformed to the way the world thinks about the Bible, about what is truth and what isn't. If it's okay with me, it's truth. No, it's okay with God, it's true. We, we, we are losing our way. In 1 first, in first Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul goes into this whole deal of worldly thinking and how the church must be on guard against it. In that passage in verse, in verse 20 and 21, Paul says, God made foolish the wisdom of the world. Wisdom is as smart as you get. <laughs> Wisdom of the world is as smart as they can get. And the smartest they can get is foolishness with God. Let's show you how smart he is. <laughs> we are in so many fights today. The devil has started so many fires in the church. We are in so many fights. And listen, you can't win. You, listen, you'll never win this unless you understand absolute. And you don't have to make people believe absolute truth. All you have to do is state it. It fights its own fight. You don't have to get somebody saved. What you have to do is present the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But you got to be a good, you got to carry the news out there. You got to be willing to put yourself out a little bit and say, look, that's not true. Listen, here, I was talking last week, just about everybody comes in. I say to them, they got, eh, eh, eh. I go like, what's the Bible say? I told you, that I tell you this over and over again. They don't know. I'll say, well, you got your Bible with you? Well, I didn't bring it in. Well, get right out there. Did I bring mine? Hello. Run right out there and get your Bible. Most of the time, they don't even carry it in their car. Listen, you have permission. You can, this is, you can carry. You don't have to have approval from the government. You can be a carrier. <laughs> Mrs. Eskew, remember Mrs. Eskew? Some of you do way back. There were foundings, f founding people on our, in our church. Mrs. Eskew packed. She packed a weapon. I made a big mistake one day. I happened to be going down one aisle of the grocery store and saw her over in the other aisle. So I thought, that, I thought I'd be cute, that little boy in me. You know that little boy that sometimes gets in there? It said, go over there and sneak up behind her and scare her a little. I thought it sounds like a good idea. See, never talk to yourself about stuff. <laughs> I said, that sounds like a, that, I think I could have fun with this. I knew her well. I slipped up behind Mrs. Eskew. I took my finger and I put her in her bag and I said, give me everything you got. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how quick this happened. It was like a twinkling in an eye. She went like this. <laughs> and she put a gun to my head. I mean like this.
I spanked that little boy all the way home. I gave him a thrashing. You stupid! I knew she packed, but in a grocery store, I thought I was safe. Don't do that. Don't do that. Listen to what Jesus said in John 17, 17 to the Father in his prayer before the cross. He says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You know what that is? He's talking absolute. You know, life can change like seasons or weather. If you live long enough, you'll go through all the seasons of the weather. Life may change like seasons or, or weather, but not the reality of truth attached to it. The phrase, truly, truly, I say unto you, is used three times. We've looked at two of them today, both of them dealing with born again. The next time when we come back, we're going to look at the third one, where he's going to introduce Nicodemus to the begotten, the, begot the only begotten Son of God. Nicodemus said, oh, you know, I'm in a, we're, we're, we are, we are really interested in you. We've seen signs. We think this could well be. We've seen the signs of the miracles. And, mm. Boy, when he gets into that third, verily, verily, I say to you, he's going to pull out this thing. I, I, not only I am, am I the son of man, I am the only begotten son of God. When he gets through with Nicodemus with this third one, boy, Nicodemus is going to have a lot to chew on. A lot to chew on. So when we come back the next time, I'm going to talk about the dangers of not receiving the spiritual birth. Remember, though, that the amen has two sides. There's a divine side and a human side. Amen on the divine side or the God side means it is and shall be so. It is and shall be so. And on the human side, it means so let it be. And boy, you better be careful when you say, let it be. Because God takes that serious. You may not, but he does. It is and shall be when God speaks, he expects faith to respond, so let it be. See, so let it be is a faith response. God says, it is and so shall it be. And then he states what it is, whatever it is, it is and so shall it be. Be, be silent unless you're willing to put it to faith. Put feet on the word of God in your life. Put it to faith. That says, so let it be. So let it be. And that's quite a compliment to God. That's a doxology within your soul. That's a moment of worship with God. You may not realize that's a moment of worship. That's a moment of worship. On the human side, he wants you to hear it. He wants you to understand it. He wants you to believe it. And he wants to hear a response from you. And so your response is, so let it be. In, uh, in the Israel, they would have the people respond. And when the people said amen, they knew it meant, so let it be. Didn't mean amen. It meant, so let it be. They, they did recitals things. Point number four, in closing, in our lesson text of verses 1 through 8 of John 3, Nicodemus brought three cans. He brought three cans that he couldn't open to Jesus as if he had a can opener could do it. He brought three cans. We miss them because we don't pay attention to them. So I want you to look back with me to the third chapter of John. Let's go to open your Bibles. What do you think? I gave you a cookie and then going to send you home? Come on now. Gave you a cup of coffee and a little, a little dessert to get you through the second hour. Sugar and caffeine, that'll do it, won't it? <laughs> it usually does for me. Look at, I want, I want to show you three cans. And he brought three cans, you know, vegetable soup and things like that. Brought three cans. 
He wants Jesus to open them. Here's verse 2. The man came at night and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one, no one can. No one can. There's first can. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus responds to that can. So it's a lucky day for you that you brought that can because I got a can opener. Truly, truly, I say to you, it goes around the top, the top is off, and uh, we're serving it. Got it? So he gave him very, very, I say to you, there's the first can opener, right? We saw what was in the can. He had signs, and he had, he, he had doubt, unless. Right? So look at verse 4. Nicodemus, they, he's got the first can opened, so he goes to a second can. Nicodemus, how can... How can? Sounds like an Indian. How can? How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born, can he? Boy, he's full of cans. But it's the same can. He just can't get it open. Do you see that? Okay. These are all, I'm looking for spiritual birth cans. So what's Jesus do? He gets his can opener out. Truly, truly, I say to you, and he opens it up. How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time. See, Jesus, remember I told you, he looked at this word enter. He looked at the word signs and said see. He looked at the word enter and used enter again, right? I told you, I say, that's a can stuff. Right? And then Jesus goes into this second idea of you must be born. You must be born. And what, what is Jesus doing? He's talking with a guy who's religious, not saved, but religious. Jesus is checking his God consciousness. What do you know about God I'm willing to stay with? And so he's dealing with God consciousness, bringing him to gospel hearing. And this is what he's doing. He's bringing the gospel hearing. He talks about, you can't, he's talking about, you must be born again. And when he gets to the third can, when he gets to the third can, he's going to go into mechanics. The, the big word that's going to be connected to the third can is the word believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe would have eternal life and would not perish. The key word for the gospel of John is the word believe to be saved. You know where he got the idea? Jesus. Jesus taught it. He's teaching it to Nicodemus. You don't work your way. You believe your way. You don't work your way. You see, Nicodemus... Nicodemus, in the first can, Nicodemus understood Jesus was referring to a second birth, but he couldn't figure it out. In the second one, he's struggling with the concept of, of two births. I can't get this idea of two births. And Jesus says, your first birth is not enough. I'm not talking about the first birth. I'm talking about a second birth. And then he's going to say, how is it that you, being a teacher of the word of God, with all of this theological training, with all of these degrees, you don't know how to be saved except by works? That when I say to you that salvation is a gift of God's grace, that that has no meaning to you? How is that possible? And so this is where Jesus is. Jesus says to him in verse 7, Do not be shocked that I said to you, you must be born again or born from above. Because, you see, listen, he didn't wait for Nicodemus. He went, he could see it. Nicodemus was just vibrating. He was absolutely, he was absolutely speechless. He was flabbergasted, whatever terms you want. He, he went, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. But, 
listen to me, but I'm interested. I'm sitting, working on my lesson, sitting at my office. I noticed this young lady, every once in a while I would look back, but I, I thought just because I was cute. No, I know. I have them do this a lot. They, they're shocked that I'm absolutely studying the Bible in a restaurant. <laughs> I mean, that's worse than laying my weapon out on the table. And she finally couldn't stand it. She came over. I went, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. She stopped and she said, what you studying? I said, sit down. She said, will this take long? I said, well, how much time you got? She said, well, I got to be to work at such and such a time. I said, well, go, go get your stuff and bring it over here. We'll set your clock and when you're ready to go, you go. Because... It's going to take a while for me to explain to you. They're so hungry, people. She said, when are you coming the ne next I, I got to go. I got to go. I know. I know. When are you going to come back? Oh, I'm said, I'm, I'm here every day. What time? 7.30, 9.30? Every day? I went, Yeah. Every day but Sunday, they close. I have to go to church that day. <laughs> she said, can I come back, study with you? I said, yeah, what kind of Bible you got? She said, well, I got three. I said, well, what three are they? She said, well, I have a King James. I have a new King James. And I have my Catholic Bible. I said, well, which one do you study the most from? What's your favorite? And she thought, uh, New King James. I said, that's one I want. What church you go to? She told me. I said, well, I see why you have the Catholic Bible then. That's your, that, that your Sunday morning Bible, right? Yeah. But the one you study most out of? Yeah. It's what? My new King James. Will you bring that new King James with you? They are so hungry, people. They are so hungry. They are so hungry for somebody just to say, it's okay to have your Bible in here. It's okay to open it up. I love it. She said, I love my Bible. Yep. So we are, when we come back next time, we're going to take a look at the third one because he goes into a long discourse and he talks about the danger of not being born again. This is a day, you know, We've all had this day when you met Christ in the most unique and special way and it changed your life forever. This is going to be this kind of a day in Nicodemus. He will never forget this day. The day he sat down with Jesus at Chick-fil-A. Had a cup of coffee and they talked. It changed their life. That's my prayer my prayer. Father, we're so thankful today for these who have come our way and studied with us. We've been able to open the scriptures and pour our heart out of it, Father, and, and, and believe it's the heart of God. Except from personal stories of my own life. I've, I've struggled to find the heart of God in this passage because Christ would only expose it didn't have an opinion of his own. 
All of his opinions came from the heart of God. The Father and I are one. Christ and I are one. I hope that's true for all of us. I can't imagine living any other way, Father. I can't imagine it. Cannot imagine it. Don't have a desire to even think about it. I want people to have that. I want these people to fall in love with the Word of God because it, it talks about the relationship He has a desire for in us. Oh, Father. May we fall in love with you and share it with everybody we meet. They'll know we, they know we have a love affair going. They'll know it. They see that light. They see that love. Encourage our hearts this week, Father. Encourage our hearts to share the truth with those that need to hear it. They need to hear that, oh, they hear truth, but it's, it's all over the place. They need to hear absolute truth. Absolute truth in Jesus' name. Amen.